Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. I'm Doug Marconet, a Managing Director at Mertz Associates, and welcome to our webinar on maximizing integration performance for acquisitions. Mertz Associates is a middle market merger and acquisition firm helping clients make strategic acquisitions or pursue strategic divestitures or sales. Our objective in the next half hour is to discuss some of the key lessons and opportunities when integrating acquisitions. I'm glad to have here with me Chris Nemeth from Keystone Group as my guest. Keystone is a management consulting company based in Chicago, and Chris heads up Keystone's M&A services practice. Chris has been in M&A for over 15 years on both the corporate side and advisory. First, a brief overview of the GoToWebinar dialog box that you should see on your screen. And I just want to point out two key features. Number one, in order to minimize or maximize the webinar dialog box, simply click on the orange button with the arrow pointing to the right or left to close or open respectively. It's highlighted here with the number one. And number two, the phones and mics are on mute. So if you have a question for us, please just type it in the Q&A section of the GoToWebinar dialog. We'll do our best to get to your questions at the end. Our agenda for this one half hour webinar is simple. First, we'll outline the core challenges faced when integrating two businesses. Then, we'll cover a set of key things you can and should do to maximize integration performance. Finally, for Q&A, as I just mentioned, please type your questions in the GoToWebinar question box at any time, and we will cover as many of your questions as possible at the end. Chris? Thanks, Doug. So in, in order to begin, I guess, before we kind of jump into the, um, in, in, into the, the subject around uh, success principles for M&A integration, I thought we'd start and just take a, uh, a couple of minutes and, and uh, kind of review the dynamics of uh, M&A integration and what sort of the context of it. And for that, I'd like to turn to uh, someone. I, I, I'm sure that uh, Warren Buffett doesn't know that he's been kind of a mentor for me over the years, um, but he certainly has. And so, uh, so I'd like to read to you just quickly a, a quote that Buffett made. It was in his uh, one of the Berkshire Annual Reports. I think this is uh, it's uh, in 1981, so actually uh, over 20 years old. And, uh, and and Buffett said, many managers were overexposed in impressionable childhood years to the story in which the imprisoned, enchanted prince is released from the toad's body by a kiss from the beautiful princess. Consequently, they're certain that the managerial kiss will do wonders for the profitability of the target company. This optimism is essential because absent that rosy view, why else should shareholders of Company A want to own interest in Company B at a takeover cost that's two times the market price? In other words, investors can always buy toads at the going price for toads. If investors instead bankroll princesses who wish to pay double for the right to kiss that toad, those kisses better pack some real dynamite. Now, we've observed many kisses, but very few miracles. Nevertheless, many managerial princesses remain supremely confident about the future potency of their kisses, even after their backyards are knee-deep in unresponsive toads. I love it, Chris. Thank you. Uh, and really following on that, I think the reality is that, and it might surprise you, survey after survey shows that most acquisitions fail to succeed. And it's based on a number of different measures, whether it's cost of capital, stock price, overall productivity, or realization of synergies. Still, the top reasons cited for failure are lack of integration speed and poor, act, poor execution. So you would kind of expect that given the amount of time, I mean, that quote was back 20, 30 years ago. That's right. You'd think that the stats would improve over time, but that's just not the case. Right. And, um, and I was talking to Doug briefly before, and I, I, I kind of made reference. There's a, a relatively famous quote. It's actually attributed both to Ben Franklin and to Albert Einstein. But uh, the quote is that the defini definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. And <laughs> yeah. it kind of gets you scratching your head a little bit about M&A. Um, the only thing that I would say, um, so even though the uh, actual um, kind of performance data for M&A transactions uh, is, is pretty sobering and, and seems to not be trending all that well, um, I, I guess the only silver lining or upshot from all that is one thing that we are seeing a lot in the market now is a heightened level of scrutiny 
uh, and accountability, frankly, from uh, executive teams, from boards, and from uh, owner and from ownership, uh, such that you know if we're going to let you, company XYZ, you know, leverage X millions of dollars to consummate this transaction with the, uh, the promise or the expectation you'll deliver certain results over time, well, we actually want to see that. So you, you should be, know uh, very clearly, you should be measuring that and kind of reporting back on a uh, post-mortem basis. How did we actually achieve those results and how do we know? That's a great point. I, I think one other positive on this slide that I'll add is We've all been reading recently about the amount of cash on the balance sheets of public companies. There's a ton with private companies and private equity groups as well. So if they figure out the right way to go about this, there's a lot of buying power. And I think we're looking you know, forward at a lot of buy-side activity again. And so I, I think this topic is perfectly timed. OK. Um, this is you. So the, uh, you know, one of the fundamental reasons why uh, M&A integration performance has uh, kind of struggled uh, over the years mightily is uh, maybe, maybe not surprisingly, it's actually a fairly complex exercise. Um, we don't intend for you to kind of read this, uh, read all the minutia on this slide, but um, what you're seeing on the slide right now is just at a very high level, um, essentially the play that we're often asked to run for kind of a typical transaction. Um, when you're talking about actually integrating entities, there's usually, obviously, there's a, 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 an entity that's going forward. Uh, we call that the NUCO. Often there's a part that's being consolidated. We're often moving around resources. We're shifting sales from one area to another. Oftentimes we're taking out cost synergies behind the scenes. Um, that exercise in, in, in and of itself is, is relatively and, and kind of soberingly complex. Um, it's actually complicated uh, a great deal by um, a variety of issues sort of behind the scenes as well, there's usually a fair amount of skepticism uh, in the market, fair amount of skepticism certainly at the target company, and often there's a fair amount of skepticism and trepidation and a lot of noise uh, internally at the company. So you're actually trying to execute this fairly complicated strategic and operational play uh, against a backdrop of a lot of uh, maybe cynicism and, uh, and nervousness. Um, at the same time, it's uh, even further complicated by the fact that it's critical to maintain the integrity and the performance, frankly, of the ongoing operation. So essentially, it's uh, the analogy that uh, we often think of is a little bit like you're trying to do uh, some serious structural work on, a, on an airplane. And rather than having the luxury of being able to park it in the hangar and take it apart and disassemble it, put it back together, uh, in this context, you're actually having to climb out on the wing while the plane is in flight right. and work on these things and maintain the integrity of the flight as we're going, because otherwise the, the value uh, erodes. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a couple slides as well. Very good. Uh, okay, that, let's shift now to what can be done to maximize the integration performance. And I, I've asked Chris to put together what he considers to be a handful of, let's call them best practices. Yes. You know, um, yeah, I think it's important to kind of emphasize that because obviously uh, M&A integration is a very broad and very uh, complicated topic. So, uh, you know, obviously we could talk about uh, each one of these points uh, for, for quite a while. What we tried to do here uh, for this discussion is kind of give you an overview, uh, essentially kind of an elevator uh, uh, kind of level pitch for if there are only a handful full of things to focus on mm -hmm. that would provide value for that typical transaction, so across all kinds of transaction types, what would those things be? And so uh, we'll, we'll go through those those things that, uh, here. So the first one is uh, what we're calling the MPV of speed. Um, what you're looking at on the slide, so Keystone, in addition to doing kind of hands-on um, uh, advisory and integration work, uh, we also do a reasonable amount of research uh, around the subject area as well. And so what you're looking at here is uh, kind of a, a recent Keystone uh, M&A survey where we're uh, surveying serial acquirers. These are companies that do M&A day in and day out. They do this for a living. And we're asking them, what are the issues essentially that keep you awake at night on transactions? And so you can see some of the, the, uh, the issues that are listed down the left. Um, often there's uh, unrealistic assessment of timing, lack of available talent, ambiguity issues, uh, uh, inconsistent M&A execution experience throughout the operation. 
But I'll tell you, the number one thing that these companies turn to over and over is that all things being equal, the one thing that they would do differently on the transactions, they would go faster. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, speed tends to yield uh, a, a negative uh, result from a variety of perspectives. Uh, so the, the research um, has shown this for a long time. And I think uh, the more M&A research you read you know, from other firms out in the market, there's kind of violent agreement that all things being equal, faster yields a better result. Um, in addition to the research, um, that, 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 that finding is actually corroborated by our uh, hands-on project work, our em empirical experience in the market as well. So uh, this simple chart kind of here on the lower right um, shows that over time, um, not only does the probability of synergy realization begin to decrease the minute the transaction closes, so essentially you have a window of opportunity in order to realize synergies, and if we're not in a position collectively to take advantage of that and execute, that window shuts, and then becomes increasingly difficult to, to realize synergies the further out post-close you get. But equally importantly, um, and, and maybe unfortunately, the risk of operating disruption or the operate, operational risk begins to increase mm -hmm. as well. And, the, and essentially what happens is the longer that there's ambiguity, uh, either externally or internally, and you allow that to kind of fester, bad things begin to happen. So in order to summarize uh, in this red box on the lower left, we find that, that there, there is certainly a, uh, a heightened value, there's a premium, on uh, speed of integration, speed of execution, that translates into superior financial performance, superior operating continuity, key customer retention, key employee retention, and simply just managing the, uh, for lack of a better word, the grapevine and uh, allowing uh, employees on both sides of the table to kind of congregate around the water coolers and, and take our eye off of getting product out to customers and keeping lights on uh, uh, operationally. Chris, I, I would imagine preparation is key. We've seen our clients be successful when they parallel the integration planning with the due diligence prior to actually making the acquisition. So they hit that ground running when they close the deal. When do you usually get involved helping people? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, historically, I would say about half the time, uh, Keystone has been engaged in and around kind of letter of intent, so to, so to uh, work uh, shoulder to shoulder with the uh, operating people on the client side in the diligence process itself. Um, there's probably another 50% where the client has done some version of diligence on their own, and as we're getting closer to agreement, and the deal looks like uh, there's a heightened likelihood that it will be consummated, then Keystone's brought in uh, not only to kind of dust off and, and drill down on sort of the diligence assumptions and, and sort of the, uh, the preliminary synergy buckets, but, but more importantly to to uh, take some of this theoretical work and now let's begin to kind of prepare for kind of tactical action and get ready for the hard work of integration. Um, the other thing I would say, um, uh, because it, the, a lot of the uh, uh, sentiment in the market right now is that there's kind of a pending wave of M&A that's coming, particularly in the mid-market. Right, right. Um, we're getting a lot of interest from companies that are actually asking us to come in and help them with their internal capability in terms of the what's the playbook, what's the play that we're going to run, what's the process, the tools, what should they be thinking about in order to, to make sure that they're prepared for integration even prior to pulling the trigger on a transaction. So that's way in advance of any specific transaction, but we're seeing a lot of that today too. That's interesting. I've recently talked to a, a buy-side client prospect that has determined they're not so sure they really want to move forward with acquisitions just yet. But if they were to find something that was not in a position to really continue on as a viable business, it was troubled and it was going to go under, those could be some really nice opportunities. So what we talked to them about is if we started the process now and sort of get good at it, we're out there approaching targets, um, you can always just get to know people and be there and available as time goes on, and you may uncover some really good opportunities that could be done real quick. So starting even earlier could be a, a wise move. All right. So after speed, um, the the second kind of uh, kind of core principle <clears throat> to talk about would be uh, something we're calling the power of skepticism. Um, you know, it, I guess maybe related back to the the earlier discussion around kind of Warren the Warren Buffett quote, and you know, deal makers in our experience tend to be uh, somewhat optimists for the most part. 
Um, what we have found is, conversely, good M&A advisors tend to be a, a, a little bit more pessimist uh, by nature. Um, companies, in our experience, tend to do a better job, uh, especially early on in the deal process, at kind of thinking through uh, what, are, what are the synergies and, the, and essentially just the potential upside in a transaction. They tend to do a better job around that. Maybe it's just kind of human nature more than anything. It's positive, yeah. Than they do of uh, being equally rigorous and meticulous about what are, what are the critical risks that could, 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 could jump up and bite us uh, as this deal unfolds. And I'll tell you, for our money, um, you know, on the Keystone side, our guys tend to be much more worried early on in the deal about early identification of critical risk and getting out ahead of the curve on that than we are about the synergies. Kind of in short, you know, we, we typically feel like, you know, look, we'll, we'll get the synergies. We will make them happen. But if we don't mitigate some of the risks in this transaction early on, very quickly then we'll, we'll find that the synergies become relevant and that once that deal closes and we're trying to bail the boat as it's filling up with water, um, it's sort of all hands on deck and then all the initial purchase assumptions are out the window at that point. Has, has that approach ever kind of soured a deal or caused your client not to go forward? And it's an interesting question. I'd say, you know, we're, for 20 or so years, um, not as much as you would think, maybe in just a handful of cases at most. Um, it's, it's often not a, an issue of uh, canceling their, or negating the transaction. It's more an issue of making sure we're identifying these issues early enough so we can be proactive about mitigating them while we still have the time prior to the transaction actually closing. Got it. The next uh, key principle, uh, just to, to review here, would be uh, what we're calling managing kind of the soft stuff or what in the Keystone nomenclature uh, we've called the soft goods in the transaction. Um, so at a high level, what this slide is saying is that, um, again, when you kind of peel back the onion and you're looking at um, buyers and what are the issues that tend to kind of upturn the apple cart on a transaction uh, from an integration perspective, what we find is there's kind of two macro buckets of problems. So, and these probably aren't very surprising. So the, the first bucket, which is sort of the upper left in the light blue, would be uh, what we just call deal issues. So these would be things that probably you know, Doug is very familiar with in terms of, you know, uh, did we uh, target unrealistic synergies? Was the valuation just too high? Um, what is sort of the competitive dynamic that uh, maybe we have misunderstood? And then the darker blue box all has to do with uh, kind of execution. And the point that I would make on the execution side is that uh, a surprising amount of the execution difficulties, especially recently uh, in the M&A market, tend to be from uh, people issues. And you can see some of those things there where we've underestimated sort of the cultural integration complexity or there's communication problems or there's not broad-based support or we're just managing it uh, kind of poorly. But either one of those things, doing the wrong deal or doing the right deal but executing poorly, um, can, can certainly undermine the performance for yeah, sure. I concur completely. On, on, on the deal issue, poor deal side, I think it really gets summed up to one word, and that's what is your strategic objectives, so strat strategy. And if you have the wrong one or not enough of one, that's a huge reason for failure. That's really quite a bit upstream from the integration challenges. So if you don't start with the right deal, you can't make it good. One of our uh, buyers once told me that if they paid 20% more for a good acquisition, they'd still be happy with it. At the end of the day, it'd still be a good deal. But if they paid 20% less for a bad acquisition, that's still a bad deal, right? Definitely. And on, on the cultural side, what you just talked about, I have seen in spades um, another buyer client of ours, what they would do is when they would first visit a company and they'd be walking on the tour through the offices with the owner, through the plant, what have you, they were keenly observing how that owner interacted, what the culture was like, and they would actually make a decision right then and there whether this is a deal that they want to pursue based on that culture and how they foresee it fitting with theirs. And I'd, I'd say, you know, to Doug's point, that's even more of an issue in the mid-market, perhaps, than in some of the large cap acquirers that we work with, where so much of the, the value, the inherent value in a mid-market transaction really relates to the quality of the people and to the extent that you can actually work with those people and, frankly, retain them over some period of time. 
because they have quality relationships. There, there's usually a handful of people that are critical to the operation. And if you lose those people um, or don't get them bought in, then uh, you know, we've just overpaid you know, for a bunch of office supplies at the end right. of the day, and the deal sure. doesn't make any sense at all. The, um, the next principle to talk about, and this is one that's very near and dear to Keystone's heart, is just something that we call bite-sizing the problem. So uh, one thing that you realize if you've been in and around uh, M&A uh, execution for any period of time is that there is just no shortage of things that need to be accomplished. Um, so a lot of our, you know, a lot of times when we enter the scene, you know, the company has assembled kind of a to-do list, and it's literally thousands of line items long. And, and their version of a methodology, you know, left their own devices. Well, we, I guess we start at letter A and try to work our way to letter Z. Right. And uh, and that and, and there's nothing that's more of a recipe for failure uh, in 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 our experience. So one simple way to do this, and again, you know, I emphasize there's a lot that's behind each one of these things, but I think a good rubric to think about for right now is that uh, we sort of bite-size the typical deal into three, uh, essentially you could think of them as three concurrent streams of work. Um, so the first one relates to uh, what we call functional transition. So obviously there is a litany of things within each functional area for the typical transaction, whether it's a stock purchase or an asset sale or, or whatever it is, that, that are sort of table stakes issues that, that need to be addressed. So. Obviously, you know, on the financial side, you know, in terms of managing you know, cash and taking over financial controls, legal uh, on the legal yeah. side, etc. But with, really, with it, in every functional area, there's a lot of table stakes issues. Um, one thing that I would, to, the two, I guess maybe two things I would emphasize there. One is that um, to the extent that you don't need to reinvent the wheel each time, that would be a good thing, mm -hmm. because we found that um, even though all deals uh, have their own nuances, there's a surprising amount of things that are relatively common across different transaction types at the functional level. So that's one thing that I, I would encourage you to do. Um, the second thing on the functional side is from a process perspective. At Keystone, we usually start at the customer and the customer interface, and we work our way back into the business. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, even though you know, at the level, uh, maybe uh, at the PowerPoint level, a lot of deals seem like they're no-brainers um, uh, at the outset. Um, a lot of times, the from the end customer's perspective, these transactions that seem to fit together so well introduce a lot of customer complexity. And again, if we do anything to jeopardize that customer interface in this functional transition, um, then we're we're in a little bit of trouble. I think to, to underscore the whole functional area topic here, which I think is excellent, we have, we worked with Lab Safety Supply on about a half dozen deals over several years, and they really, we could just watch it happening. They got really good at systematizing their functional integration. They knew what to do as soon as the next deal came along. It sped up the deals, and it reduced their risk. I think that's a great example of that. The uh, second work stream would be uh, around the synergies. Um, just for interest of time, uh, I would just summarize this by saying less is more. Um, that usually the problem isn't finding synergies. That's not the hard part, even though that's the exciting part. The bigger challenge is there's usually way too many things to focus sure. on and far too few interim resources. So focus on the ones that are going to count the most and that have the highest likelihood of achievability, post close and get those to the bottom line. And then the third work stream, as we talked about on the previous slide, but that's around managing the soft goods. Because uh, e even though there's a lot of ink spilled over why the deal makes strategic sense and is going to create value, most of the people in the deal have very basic questions around, will I have a job, and who do I report to, and how are the decisions going to get made, and we need to be in a position to answer those things quickly. Sounds good. The last point, and I think we've referenced this, uh, made, uh, alluded, to this uh, alluded to this maybe a couple times in this discussion, but the last key point for us is maintaining the underlying operation. You know, even in a large transaction we work on, you know, a transaction where they're, you know, uh, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars of synergy potential on the table. Um, what, what we often find is that if we take our eye off the ball um, and, and, uh, and jeopardize the operating performance, and if the underlying operation on either side of the deal falters as we're trying to run this integration play, the synergies are often just rounding error uh, given the size of that potential impact. And it's very easy to do, like we talked about, we said the play is complex. Customers are using, or your competitors are using this as an opportunity to, to try to gain market share at kind of a critical juncture. Um,
but the, I can't emphasize this enough, maintaining the, the, the underlying business and the integrity uh, of that while we're actually running this integration play at the same time. Easier said than done. Oh, certainly. And you know, an interesting parallel to the other side of our practice selling businesses is the same thing applies. When our clients are selling, I always tell them, your job is to keep running that business, keep delivering the results, and, and you know, because that's what you're selling. If that slips, you have less to sell. And so, very interesting parallel. Well, great. Um, and just a couple summary points that, that I think we should make. And really, I, I see a strong connection between today's topic and, and what Mertz does to help buyers identify and approach and negotiate a strategic acquisition search in a proactive way. If you don't start with the right acquisition, all of the integration expertise in the world is not going to help you. Now, that, that's not to say you won't find good fits by waiting for them to approach you uh, or seeing something opportunistically, but just make sure that when you are approached, you can reach in that desk drawer, pull out a file that says strategic plan, open it up, and find in there a bona fide reason to do that deal. Yeah, to that, that point, the only thing, because obviously I'm a, a fan of Warren Buffett, sure. I mean, one thing Buffett said recently, I guess they were asking him, you know, how, do, how does, uh, does he and Charlie uh, think about this stuff? And, and, and uh, Buffett said that, you know, it may, maybe it's a very pedestrian thing to say, but, but we usually advocate just taking out a sheet of paper. And if we cannot articulate on that sheet of paper what our, you know, clearly what's our rationale for doing this and what are the key assumptions, that this transaction hinges on, hinges on, then we just pass and we wait for the next one. And I, I think that's uh, I think that's pretty eloquent. Uh, on the integration performance side, we talked about these kind of key themes, but uh, but we got them listed here just by way of review. So all things being equal, faster does yield a better result, and it's deceptive because there are a lot of forces in the deal that uh, want to cause companies to dig their heels in and go more slowly, but that tends to be the kiss of death. Um, thinking about the downside of the deal in a balanced, with a balanced perspective, and balancing against that against the kind of the fun, you know, upside of the transaction tends to be critical. Don't forget about the soft stuff in the deal because the soft stuff can be the hard stuff in the context of M&A. Uh, prioritization and focus, uh, obviously critical, and being able to maintain that as the going gets rough. And then the last one, executing and, and, and maintaining uh, seamless uh, operating performance for the underlying entities while we're running this integration play, all, all keys. Thank you, Chris. That brings us to Q&A. As a reminder, to submit your question now, simply type it in the question box in the webinar dialog box. And we do have one question already. I'm going to start with that. That is, um, how would your advice differ for acquisitions of troubled companies? I think there are a lot of those in today's market, especially when it comes to the people or soft issues. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Nothing like leading with a tough one, I guess. <laughs> but uh, it's a very uh, timely question for sure, uh, given the dynamics in the market today. Uh, so a few things I would say uh, just quickly. Uh, one is that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, premium on diligence is just critical. Because obviously, you know, just common sense would tell you that for every buyer there's a seller. And oftentimes a seller in a trouble acquisition will have uh, uh, a lot of issues that they prefer for you not to dig into, right. uh, but all the more reason to dig into them uh, in our experience. Um, the other, other thing that I would say, just broadly speaking, uh, is that speed is even doubly critical in a troubled situation. And I think probably I, I don't need to go into that too much here, but there are 50 reasons why, uh, why that would be the case. The other thing I would say, though, is, and maybe it's a little bit counterintuitive, is that there's often areas of opportunity in a troubled transaction um, that uh, aren't readily apparent, um, apart from the, the favorable valuation, which I think mm -hmm. is one of the initial appeals for people. The other thing that we find over time is that there are often areas that have been underinvested in or underfunded for an extended period of time, that if you can find the right strategic fit and you can make a couple of targeted investments in an area, um, you can actually reap substantial returns from that, that uh, makes, in a troubled environment. That, that makes a lot of sense. I think finding those can be a challenge, which is what I was talking about before with, with a prospective buyer client of ours who recognizes there's opportunity out there to take businesses that have been underinvesting, may not even make it, rather than let them go away completely. There is a going concern value there. And if you can go after those and find them and integrate them properly, 
you've got a formula to really do well. Absolutely. Well, that brings us to the end of our 30 minutes. It goes quickly. Uh, if we weren't able to get to your question, uh, please bear with us. Chris and I will get back to you. Um, I see a couple questions here about having the slides available. Uh, we will endeavor to do that, I think, upon request. So if you would like the slides, just let us know. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your time. I'd like to give a big thank you to Chris Nemeth for being our guest this morning, and I hope that you enjoyed the webcast. Our next webinar is on October 12th with special guest Mary Scheibel of Scheibel, Alaska, talking about successful communications for M&A. Finally, on behalf of everyone at Mertz, thank you for attending this morning. We truly appreciate your interest, and please call if we can be of help. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.